I'm Joan Youngman. I'm a senior fellow here at the Lincoln Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture on property tax abatements, land value tax in disguise, uh, by Professor John Anderson of the University of Nebraska, who's a visiting fellow here at the Lincoln Institute. John is an economist, and the wide range of his interests covers public finance, taxation, property taxation, economic development, urban economics, and a deep interest in the issues facing economies in transition. Um, he's an engaged scholar. He's someone who is very willing to put his academic expertise uh, to the use of improving public policy. Uh, he's advised many legislatures and state agencies. He's served as assistant treasurer of the state of Michigan. Uh, he has um, served as a senior economist with the Council of Economic Advisors in Washington. And he has worked with transition economies, almost too many to name, but a few of them just in alphabetical order, include Bulgaria, China, Macedonia, Moldova, Mongolia, Russia, Tajikistan. And he and his family lived in Moldova for a year while he was helping with economic issues there. Um, he's been associate dean and interim dean at the College of Business Affairs. Uh, at Nebraska where he won the Distinguished Faculty Award in 2007. Um, and his voluminous writings include a new edition of his public finance textbook just out this year, um, and literally tens and tens of journal articles uh, on everything from the effect of the U.S. mortgage interest deduction in the federal income tax uh, to uh, an article in Russian on privatization of state property. Uh, that was written in honor of the 200th anniversary of the economics department at Moscow State University. And John wrote it in English, but it was the um, chair of the department who was his translator. So his work with Lincoln has touched on so many of our critical issues. Uh, last June, he was talking about land leasing and value capture at our annual land policy conference. Um, he and Richard England, a visiting fellow, uh, are working on issues uh, concerning use value assessment of agricultural property for property tax purposes. He contributed the overall review chapter, looking at all the evidence on land value taxation in the 2009 volume that was edited by Dick Dye, our visiting fellow who's here, and Richard England. And next month, when you get uh, your newsletter, Landlines, you'll see that he has an eight-page article on access to land and building permits, uh, which include excellent photographs of Mongolia, Turkey, and Moldova taken by John Anderson. <laughs> but I think one of the things we're proudest of here at Lincoln is that John received Lincoln Fellowship support when he was doing his uh, graduate work and his dissertation in economics. So this was long before we had formalized the C. Lowell Harris program for dissertation fellowship support. And we can only hope that the young scholars who are receiving these fellowships now will turn out to be as productive and as public spirited as John is. So please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you, Joan, for that kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I am very grateful to the Lincoln Institute, uh, as Joan said, from my graduate uh, school days uh, onward, they've been very supportive of uh, my interests in economics. When uh, Dick Dye and I were talking about some land value tax issues, uh, we began to uh, focus on this notion uh, that uh, property tax abatements, uh, which uh, I've studied for a number of years, uh, might be an indirect form of land value tax. Uh, and uh, our work on the land value tax led us to think a little bit harder about that. And uh, what I'm presenting today is a joint paper uh, with uh, Dick. Uh, so I want to acknowledge this is a joint uh, work with Dick Dye, uh, who is at the University of Illinois and a fellow here at the Lincoln Institute. Uh, we got support from Lincoln uh, to do this work, and uh, it's a preliminary uh, study which we uh, hope to flesh out in fuller detail uh, with a group of scholars that we're asking to uh, 
uh, come in uh, in late January and talk about this a, a bit more fully and see whether there's uh, merit to pursuing this idea in uh, more depth uh, academically and also in terms of policy implementation. Uh, so we view ourselves at the beginning of this process and thinking through uh, whether uh, tax abatements uh, can be used as an in indirect way of accomplishing uh, a notable objective, which is to move toward land value taxation, at least in some contexts. So, by way of introduction, uh, there are many advantages of a land value tax uh, that have been well known for a long time, going back at least to Henry George, if not earlier. He believed in competitive markets and private property for encouraging efficiency in production, uh, but he recognized that the return to land, which is a fixed factor, was a return that was in some sense uh, unearned or unjustified, and it was distinct from the return to capital improvements that might have been applied to the land by the landowner. And so he proposed retaining private ownership, uh, but taxing away the value of the land, uh, which reflected more fully uh, either location characteristics or natural resources or the value of uh, the public goods and services and amenities that, that might uh, be there. And he thought, ultimately, uh, that if you taxed uh, land only, uh, you would get uh, landowners uh, putting their land into its highest and best use, as we like to call it. So uh, there are very strong both efficiency and equity arguments in favor of uh, taxing land, uh, but not taxing the structures and improvements that are applied to land. And of course, this is a strong theme that runs throughout uh, much of the work uh, here at the Lincoln Institute uh, uh, that we acknowledge. So under a land value tax, the value of the land is taxed, but not the value of the capital improvements that are applied to the land. Uh, and as I said, both efficiency and equity gains uh, come from that when compared to a traditional property tax uh, where you apply generally uh, one tax rate to the combined value of uh, the land, the site, uh, and all improvements that are uh, on that land. So the essential issue we wanted to look at in this work is whether it's possible to mimic the effects of a land value tax for business property. That's how we're starting to think about this, by using a traditional property tax with abatements for capital improvements. My thinking on this goes back to work I've done uh, related to uh, communities in the Detroit metro area. Uh, prior to moving out to Nebraska, I spent a lot of years in Michigan and did research related to uh, the, uh, the municipalities in the metro Detroit area. Um, my colleague uh, Rob Wassmer and I uh, did a lot of uh, research and published a book in 2000 on, uh, on Detroit communities and uh, the way they were using economic development incentives of all kinds, including abatements. And uh, we found that among the 112 municipalities in Metro Detroit, for example, uh, the average community was abating away about 35% of its industrial tax base. And so uh, property tax abatements uh, can be a very substantial uh, way by which uh, communities are uh, providing economic development incentives and they can represent a very large uh, share of the potential tax base uh, as well. So thinking along those lines, uh, it's not inconceivable uh, that you could expand abatements in a direction uh, that is consistent with land value taxation instead of being arbitrary with regard to uh, granting uh, particular abatements to particular firms and the specific projects, uh, but doing it in a more comprehensive, systematic way. So what we do in this paper, uh, Dick Dye and I, is provide an overview of what the ideal abatement program would look like from the point of view, if your policy objective were to mimic uh, the way a land value tax works, and then we, uh, once we've set up the ideal, uh, then we look at how uh, states actually do it with their abatement programs that they permit under state statutes, and uh, we compare the two, and then we comment on uh, how the ideal uh, is different from the actual practice, and then we make some policy su suggestions for how you might uh, 
reconfigure the existing abatement programs in order to be more uh, consistent with what an ideal abatement plan would look like if your objective were to mimic a land value tax. So that's the, uh, the map of uh, where I'm headed here. Uh, there's an extensive economic development literature that provides a justification for selective use of abatements for economic development purposes. Location-based incentives uh, of many types have been analyzed in the literature. The key idea, of course, is if you reduce the cost of operation in a particular location, you enable firms to operate more profitably there, and then you encourage them to locate there. So firms that are sensitive to these costs uh, are more likely to locate in your jurisdiction. And there's some evidence, uh, although I won't uh, overstate the case, there's some evidence that this can be effective uh, in encouraging economic development. Uh, the work that Rob and I did for Detroit indicated that there are some incentives that are uh, more effective than others. And even the ones that are effective, may, uh, their effectiveness may dissipate over time as uh, other communities mimic those incentives. But uh, despite those caveats, there's evidence uh, in the newer uh, literature uh, that some incentives uh, can matter. Uh, the incentives target uh, different uh, forms of cost for the firm, including uh, labor costs as well as capital costs. Uh, and the, of course, the property tax abatement programs are aimed directly at the capital costs for firms. They're typically applied to industrial property and granted to firms that make new investments in the community, uh, new plant, new equipment, uh, new personal property, so to speak, and uh, uh, may be engaged either in uh, new facilities or in renovating uh, older existing facilities. So an automotive plant uh, in Metro Detroit uh, uh, might have been built uh, from scratch, uh, like the new uh, uh, facilities in Pontiac, or uh, could have been an older plant, uh, like the Ford plant that was modified to uh, produce uh, Mazda automobiles, where they essentially tore down the old plant, uh, and uh, it was a major renovation and created a new plant. Uh, but the incentives can be substantial. Uh, in the Michigan case, they typically are 50% uh, abatements on, on the renovations of the new uh, uh, capital costs uh, for a period of years, uh, depending on the uh, particular uh, abatement. The, uh, there are several rationales for these abatement programs. Uh, one is an externality rationale. Uh, and uh, I think the most notable paper in this line of literature is the one by uh, Therese McGuire, who is also associated with Lincoln, uh, and uh, her co-author, Teresa Garcia Mia. They've built a model in which cities attract firms, both for their own productive cap capital and for a form of uh, what economists call agglomeration economies. Uh, they call them concentration externalities. Uh, but these externalities benefit other existing firms in the city. And so you get this interaction where by attracting uh, firms uh, to the metro area, uh, there are benefits that are conferred on existing firms. And if you take into account those benefits, uh, you get the conclusion coming out of their model that it's actually efficient to offer tax incentives at a rate that's below the benefit level uh, for firms in that community. That is to say, uh, it's, it's efficient to offer incentives that lower the cost below uh, the actual cost of providing the local public services to that firm when you take into account the externalities uh, that are conferred on other firms as well. And so this is the externality rationale that because uh, uh, firms generate these uh, beneficial spillover effects, uh, if you take those into account, uh, you, can get a, you can get a justification for providing abatements uh, that lower the cost to the firms. Uh, in a review of that paper and several other studies, Ed Glazer, who's here at Harvard, provides five reasons for location-based incentives. It's a useful way to frame your thinking about uh, abatements and other incentives in general. First of all, there's the consumer and producer surplus uh, argument that tax incentives reflect the bids by cities to attract firms that generate surpluses for their city residents. Uh, 
whether these are on the consumer side or on the producer side, uh, these benefits are there and, uh, and, uh, and the incentives offered by uh, cities uh, just reflect the fact that they're willing to bid uh, in order to attract those firms, knowing uh, that those uh, uh, consumer and producer surpluses will be generated if the firm locates in that community. Uh, secondly, an agglomeration economy's argument, similar to the one I just mentioned, uh, where cities bid to capture firms generating agglomeration economies. This is a, a relatively old idea in economics in, in new form here, the way uh, uh, McGuire and uh, Mia have, uh, have uh, framed it. There's the ex post appropriation argument, which is a kind of a t time inconsistency argument. Uh, that cities give upfront incentives to firms to locate uh, in their jurisdiction in order to compensate for future tax increases. So the city may uh, expect full well that in the future it will have to raise taxes on the firm. Uh, so they give an upfront incentive for the firm to locate there, and this is compensation for what they know they'll actually have to do later on, which is to uh, raise uh, taxes. And uh, th this is a variant of. Uh, a time inconsistency argument which can be quite efficient if not equitable uh, over time. Uh, so it's a pure efficiency kind of argument. Uh, next we've got tax discrimination as a uh, rationale. Uh, in order to extract the maximum revenues from firms located in the city, uh, you may want to treat uh, inframarginal firms differently from marginal firms, right? The marginal firms uh, you, you may have to give an abatement to in order to get them to uh, locate because they're responsive. The inframarginal firms are the ones who have already located whose uh, behavior is unlikely to be changed and so you may want to have uh, custom tax prices in effect uh, through a mechanism of tax discrimination. Uh, and uh, finally, there's the corruption and influence argument. The tax incentives uh, reflect the ability of firms to bribe or coerce city government leaders. This is a very cynical view, right? Uh, that uh, it's, it's purely uh, let's make a deal kind of proposition between the firm negotiating with the uh, local jurisdiction and uh, the incentives that, that, that result from that negotiation process may simply reflect uh, the bargaining ability of the firm relative to the city government. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing which uh, I'll admit I saw in Michigan when you've got a very large manufacturing firm, a global uh, worldwide manufacturing firm, and they come in and they want to negotiate with a township about a tax abatement. Uh, and the, uh, you know, the bargaining ability of the two uh, players in this process uh, is, is not very similar. Uh, they can be quite uh, different. The uh, small local government may feel uh, that they have no ability uh, to say no. Uh, there's also a market imperfection rationale for these kinds of uh, uh, incentives. If a community's got negative characteristics that uh, increase the cost of doing business there, a property tax abatement uh, provides uh, a way by which the local government can comp compensate for the higher cost of doing business there. And if the land market operates efficiently, we would expect any kind of negative characteristics like this to be capitalized into land value. The land value ought to reflect those negative characteristics, uh, and uh, you would think that that would take care of the situation. Uh, so we, we would expect that variations in land value would uh, fully compensate or take into account the, the location characteristics. But it could be that land markets are not perfectly competitive and, and they don't do that completely. And so from this point of view, uh, tax abatements may play a role in substituting for efficiently operating land markets. Uh, so tax abatements are kind of a second best way of solving that problem if you don't have a competitive land market. So all of that to say, uh, there are a number of uh, rationales why uh, we may uh, see so many property tax abatement programs. Uh, by last count, uh, 35 states in the United States have uh, tax abatement programs of one form or another and uh, they're quite uh, prevalent, especially in the larger industrial uh, states. Uh, so the land value tax rationale uh, is uh, familiar to uh, many of you at Lincoln. 
uh, the, uh, the book on land value taxation that's been referred to, it contains a chapter by uh, Wally Oates and Bob Schwab where they review the land value tax relative to a traditional property tax. And here are their main conclusions, uh, that the burden of a land tax falls on the landowners, uh, and that a land tax is neutral and does not distort economic decisions and does not generate an excess burden or a deadweight loss. This is a, a, a cost imposed by any tax that's uh, over and above the revenue that would be generated by that tax because the, the tax uh, alters the behavior of uh, the economic agents involved. Uh, the nice thing about a land tax is that uh, if land is fixed in supply, uh, there's no such uh, efficiency loss, no excess burden associated with it, and it's an efficient form of taxation uh, that's the economist's definition of efficiency in taxation. Uh, and a land tax does not have any impact on the timing of land development. Uh, so it's got very nice characteristics associated with it from an economic theory point of view. And the benefit of switching from a traditional property tax to a land value tax is that it eliminates the discouragement that a traditional property tax has to invest in new capital, uh, new plant, and new equipment. Uh, if, you, if you're not taxing that plant and equipment, there's no distortion in that, uh, in that market. So if land value taxes are such great things, uh, why don't we have more of them? Why are they relatively rare? This is one of the questions that's been asked in the, in the book I've referred to. And there are legal, administrative, and political impediments uh, to the implementation of land value taxes. Uh, on the other hand, if a property tax abatement program is an indirect way to mimic a land value tax, uh, stop and think about this. Uh, property tax abatement programs are pervasive. They're widespread and they're fairly easy to implement. And so in terms of the uh, expediency of actually uh, accomplishing some of the goals of a land value tax, uh, it, it may be more feasible to do it by way of uh, uh, an abatement uh, program redesigned uh, than to start from scratch and implement a land value tax. Steve Barassa uh, had a chapter in the land value tax book where he looked at the adoption of the split rate tax, which is an, imp an impure uh, form of a land value tax, in the notable example of Pittsburgh, which uh, everybody who talks about land value taxes talks about Pittsburgh. Uh, which uh, had, uh, beginning in 1913, a split rate tax where uh, the rates on land uh, were higher than the rates on uh, improvements. And that lasted until 2001 when they eliminated uh, the split rate, uh, impure version of a land value tax. And uh, he says in that chapter that virtually every kind of new construction or renovation was eligible for some form of property tax abatement during that regime. And he also argued that Abatements reduce the effective tax rates on improvements relative to the land and thus achieve a similar result as land value taxation. So as we work through this, uh, this book on land value taxation, Steve was thinking along these lines as well. Uh, and so uh, that's really the genesis of uh, why several of us are pursuing this idea. So how could abatements be configured uh, to mimic a land value tax if that were your policy objective. That's uh, the next topic to which we turn. Uh, think about property values and taxes. The traditional property tax applies a nominal tax rate to the assessed value of the property, including both the value of the land and the capital. Of course, the effective tax rate will depend not only on the nominal tax rate, but the assessment ratio, uh, and both matter. Uh, ultimately, for economic uh, incentive purposes, it's the effective tax rate that's relevant, not the nominal rate. And so that's why assessment systems are so important to think about in this uh, process as well. The tax rate that's applied to the capital improvements increases the cost of capital, and so it discourages capital investment in business structures. That's the problem with the traditional system. Under a pure land value tax, only the land values taxed and the tax rate on capital improvements would be zero. Uh, so you would have a, a nominal rate applied to uh, land value and a zero rate applied to improvements. Abatements reduce the tax rate on capital improvements 
Uh, but in order to mimic a land value tax, the taxable value on improvements ought to be zero. If that's your objective, uh, that's what you'd have to do. A traditional property tax with selective abatements goes part of the way to a land value tax. It's more like a split rate tax or a graded tax system where you've got differential rates applied to the different components of the tax base. Uh, and so it's, a, it's, it's part of the way toward land value tax, uh, but in order to get to a land value tax, you'd have to go all the way to a zero rate on the capital improvements. So an ideal tax abatement program in order to mimic a land value tax would have to have three characteristics. Uh, it would have to be permanent uh, with no time limits on the abatements after which capital improvements become taxable. Uh, typically, uh, abatement programs have uh, a fixed uh, term length. I'll show you uh, some evidence about uh, what the terms are across uh, programs in the United States in a moment. Uh, but if you really want to go to a land value tax, it would be permanent. Secondly, it would have to be comprehensive. Uh, you'd have to abate away all capital improvements uh, within a given class of property. And at least initially, we're thinking about uh, how this could be done uh, with respect to business property, uh, manufacturing or industrial property is, is the natural starting point to think about this, uh, rather than going all the way to opening it up to uh, all classes of property, including residential uh, and uh, commercial and other properties. And thirdly, uh, the abatement program would have to be unconditional. No restrictions on qualifying for the capital tax abatement and no clawback provisions, right? No restrictions in terms of the number of jobs that are created, no restrictions on the size of the investment, no restrictions uh, uh, along those lines, and then no clawbacks. Uh, if, if you fail to produce that number of jobs, you have to uh, uh, reimburse uh, the abatement and so on. Uh, in my experience, the clawback provisions are not very effective in any case. Uh, I wasn't aware of any situation uh, that, was, that effectively uh, uh, got uh, abatement money back after the fact if uh, the conditions of the abatement had not been met. So current characteristics of abatement programs are time limitations, uh, often uh, 10, 15, 20 year abatement programs. Uh, secondly, made available selectively certain classes of property like industrial or commercial and within those classes, limited to selective purposes like new construction or renovation or expansion of a plant, uh, fairly narrowly defined in some cases. And uh, thirdly, conditional. Conditional on the creation of a number of new jobs or the provision of a minimum amount of new investment uh, with clawbacks and so on. So you see that uh, the, the ideal abatement program would look different than uh, most of the uh, existing abatement programs that, that uh, we're familiar with. So let me talk a little bit about uh, existing programs uh, to give you a sense for uh, how much they would have to be uh, adapted or changed in order to achieve this objective we're talking about. Uh, nice uh, survey uh, done uh, in 2005 by uh, Dale Height, Mikesell, and uh, Zorn looking at what they call standalone property tax abatement programs. And their acronym for that is SAPTAPS, okay? Uh, so uh, standalone property tax abatement programs, uh, they've uh, looked at all 50 states and uh, found 35 states have these uh, standalone programs for real property improvements. Now, 16 states uh, also provide improvements, uh, abatements for land, 24 states provide abatements for personal property, that is uh, machinery and equipment, anything that's not uh, permanently affixed uh, to the land or this. Uh, and uh, 18 states uh, require a threshold value of new investment or increased property value, and another eight states require a threshold increase in jobs or payroll in order to qualify. Most states uh, provide abatements for capital improvements applied to land. So, Here's a, a table that uh, summarizes uh, by property class uh, improvements, land, and personal property. So 32 states provide uh, abatements for improvements, uh, which makes sense from uh, our framework thinking about a land value tax. Uh, 
Uh, sadly, though, 16 states provide abatements for land value, uh, which uh, from our point of view is exactly wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, 16 states do that. And uh, 24 states provide uh, abatements for personal property, which is consistent with the land value tax view. Uh, so we would, we would uh, affirm the states that provide uh, abatements uh, for improvements in personal property, but uh, not for land. Uh, that's exactly uh, backwards. Uh, they've also uh, looked at uh, the property tax, uh, excuse me, the property classes abated, and uh, they find uh, 29 states provide abatements for commercial property, 33 for industrial or manufacturing, nine for primary activities, uh, and 20 for residential. Uh, so uh, certainly my experience in Michigan is uh, with the industrial and manufacturing uh, abatements, which uh, have been so uh, prominent uh, in order to try to uh, maintain a manufacturing base to that economy. Uh, I'm less familiar with abatements for residential purposes uh, and uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, abatements for commercial activity can be much more problematic than they are for industrial or manufacturing. Uh, commercial property, especially when it comes to uh, restaurants, uh, dry cleaners, and so on, uh, can be quite uh, mobile, uh, and it's easy enough to move right across the street uh, outside the jurisdiction, and uh, I see less of a, uh, a justification in that case. Uh, because they're, they, uh, they can be quite uh, footloose. Uh, thirdly, uh, they provide an overview of the modes of abatement in terms of how, how do the states uh, provide abatements, what are the actual methods by which they do that. Uh, you'll see that the most frequent mode here is number five, where states will abate away a percentage of the value added only. So this is when uh, a manufacturing firm, for example, comes in and they increase uh, the amount of plant and equipment, the value of the plant and equipment. Uh, so we're talking about value added here in terms of uh, improvements, value added uh, for Im improvements on the property. Uh, 15 states do that. Uh, 12 states uh, provide uh, an abatement, which is a percent of the taxable value of the property. Uh, so the difference, of course, is number five. Uh, pr abates away part of the increase, and uh, number two abates away just a fraction of the total value. Uh, then following that, we've got uh, number one, uh, eight states providing an abatement for some percentage of the tax liability, uh, not the taxable value. Uh, then that begins to conflate both the tax rate and the tax base. Uh, from a policy point of view, that's uh, less preferable. Uh, then six, uh, six states uh, do number six. Uh, they freeze the value of the property, uh, much like would be done in a tax increment financing district where you would uh, freeze the value uh, during uh, the, the period in which the TIF district uh, was operative. Uh, and, uh, and then we've got various other uh, modes which are used less frequently. Uh, including number nine, reimbursement or incentive payments. Uh, so I don't think any of us would uh, agree that upfront payments of cash are the way to do this, but uh, apparently that's done in some states. Uh, number f table number four talks about the duration of the abatement programs. And here uh, they go anywhere from one year to 25 years across the states. And uh, you'll see that the most frequent uh, Term length is uh, 10 years. So most of the abatement programs run about a decade. Uh, some of them run uh, a shorter period, five years, and uh, there are a few that stretch on out to 25 years. But it looks like the typical abatement program is about a 10-year abatement program. So you'll, you'll abate away. The prototypical property tax abatement program is one where you might abate away uh, half of the new improvements uh, for a period of 10 years. Uh, something along those lines. Okay, well, let's look at uh, evaluating how well abatement practice aligns with, uh, with the goals of land value tax that I laid out earlier. If you compare the ideal property tax abatement program uh, to mimic a land value tax with the existing programs that we've just inventoried, uh, 
uh, you'll see that the existing programs are often not well uh, configured. Abatements are applied to inappropriate types of property. Uh, my best example there is land. Uh, abating away land value is uh, the wrong way to do it. Abatements are incomplete. Uh, they're applied to a fraction of new investment. And uh, if what you want to do is mimic a land value tax, uh, you should uh, abate uh, all of the improvement of value, not a fraction. And they're limited in duration. Uh, they typically will uh, end after a finite period of time, like 10 years. And so uh, it, may, it may look like a uh, land value tax, at least in part, uh, but only for a limited period of time. So in order to uh, mimic a land value tax, uh, the abatement programs would have to be substantially redesigned. Or uh, targeted programs would have to be developed with an ex explicit land value tax motivation. Uh, you could do this in a targeted zone area uh, of an urban uh, area, a metro area, or you could do it in a planned unit development or some other fixed uh, geographic area uh, rather than doing it jurisdiction wide. Uh, there are various ways in which you could think about implementing this. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, existing abatement programs would have to be substantially uh, redesigned. So here are our policy recommendations for structuring an abatement program. Uh, if you want to redesign an existing program to move it in the direction of a land value tax, uh, recognizing it, that this may not be the, uh, the ideal way to do it, but uh, as a second best way to approximate a land value tax, this is how you could begin. So what classes of property should be included? Uh, well, our answer would be the more comprehensive, the better, uh, but it makes sense to begin thinking about manufacturing property, industrial property, uh, where uh, abatements are so common to begin with. Secondly, what design features of an abatement program best serve the objectives? Uh, and of course, here, a percentage reduction of the taxable value of improvements would be the design issue. And ideally, uh, you'd want to make that 100% if you want to mimic a land value tax. But a substantial and systematic percentage reduction is the key idea here. Uh, thirdly, what legislative cha changes would be required if you were going to move in this direction? Well, the, the direct adoption of a pure land value tax or a split rate tax uh, would encounter, in all likelihood, quite serious challenges. Uh, this, is, uh, this was evaluated by Co in the, in, the, in the 2009 land value tax book, and uh, there are substantial impediments. Part of the reason why we see so few land value taxes or split rate taxes uh, implemented is, is due to these uh, impediments. But the evidence that we've, we've uh, inventoried here suggests that an indirect implementation in the form of abatements uh, should be much less problematic in terms of legal and constitutional constraints. After all, if the, if the legal and constitutional frameworks of 35 of the states uh, give us existing abatement programs, we've got a starting point uh, that should not be uh, a great impediment. Uh, so, it seems as though the, uh, the challenges uh, to uh, moving toward land value taxation through this means uh, might be uh, substantially uh, fewer uh, than if you were starting uh, with a blank slate uh, to try to uh, develop a land value tax or a split rate system. So what are the political obstacles to this type of change? Well. Growth and jobs justification for abatement programs has political appeal, uh, but there are negatives as well, right? Uh, every, every governor loves to talk about uh, the three most important things in my state, right? Jobs, jobs, and jobs. That's uh, what the governor I served in Michigan was fond of saying, and uh, governors are still saying that, uh, especially in the current economic uh, situation. Uh, so that's got great appeal politically if you can uh, connect uh, the dots and say that these abatements lead to uh, firm location or expansion and therefore employment uh, growth. Uh, but they can be viewed as giveaways to rich corporations, right? Uh, it's just one more way in which we're giving to the 1%. Uh, 
uh, and the rest of us uh, in the 99% uh, uh, don't like that. Uh, so in the current political environment, uh, this can be problematic. Uh, here I would reference uh, Rob Wassmer's uh, uh, metaphor that he often uses as he talks about abatement programs and other incentives. And it's whether you look at the glass as being half full or half empty, right? If you're going to abate away half of the new, uh, the value of uh, capital improvements, the question is, uh, are you giving away some revenue that you would have gotten otherwise, right? Uh, or are you getting uh, half of what you wouldn't never have had uh, absent the abase abatement? Uh, so is the glass, glass half full or half empty? Well, it depends in large part on whether you think uh, the firm would have located or expanded uh, in the absence of the abatement program, uh, and, and that determines your perspective. Uh, if the firm would have located or expanded anyway, you know, the glass is half empty. You've given up half your tax base. On the other hand, if they never would have located, uh, it's half full. You've gotten at least something uh, that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And uh, that may be simplistic, but nonetheless, uh, the question of giveaways is, uh, begs the question, the but for question. Uh, but for the abatement, uh, would they have located or expanded? Uh, and that's a hard question to answer. Steve Borassa, in his chapter in the Land Value uh, Tax Book, identifies obstacles to adoption. Uh, first of all, uncertainty as to the benefits and the redistribution of tax burdens. Uh, the arguments uh, in favor of land value taxation are both efficiency and equity arguments, as I've outlined them. Uh, but the, uh, the precise form in which those benefits would show up is uh, uncertain at the outset when you think about making a policy change like this. How does that efficiency show up in some, in some specific benefit uh, to city residents? Uh, and secondly, the redistribution. Yeah, the, certainly there will be some redistribution and tax burden involved with this, and the question about how the tax burden is redistributed and who bears the burden uh, ultimately under the, the new system uh, is, uh, is also unclear. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the obstacles. Uh, any change uh, that would redistribute tax burdens uh, can be problematic uh, politically because by definition you're creating uh, winners and losers in this process. And uh, Steve also points to the two largest uh, experiments we've had in the United States uh, that have used uh, split rate taxes uh, as a variant of a land value tax. Pittsburgh and Hawaii. Uh, I've already mentioned Pittsburgh, but Hawaii is the other notable example. And in both of those cases, uh, the land value tax or the split rate tax regime has ended. Uh, and that suggests there are political problems in adopting these kinds of systems. Uh, but Steve also points out that in both of those cases, the land value tax was not rejected on its own merits, uh, but because voters identified that form of taxation with other policy failures. Uh, in the case of Hawaii, uh, he characterizes it as bad land use planning. And in the case of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, what really did it in was uh, uh, decades and decades of uh, uh, non-reassessment of the properties. And so the assessments were uh, uh, out of line uh, relative to market values. And that was the ultimate reason, uh, Steve says, that uh, they decided to move away from that form of taxation in Pittsburgh. So we've got the situation where the two most notable examples in the country uh, have both uh, ended their land value tax regimes, uh, but, but the issues are conflated here. The policy issues are conflated. It's not, it wasn't for uh, rejecting land value tax on its own merits, but because of these other uh, issues. So let me summarize and conclude, and then I'll see what questions you might have for me, and we can interact about this idea. Uh, we contend that land value taxation has uh, potential economic benefits, but it's seen limited adoption uh, and use with the traditional property tax system in place uh, everywhere, most everywhere, right? Uh, the direct implementation of a land value tax might be difficult uh, for legal, constitutional, and other obstacles uh, 
but the indirect implementation of a variant of a land value tax for business property in particular uh, might be feasible if you uh, think about using a property tax abatement mechanism in order to achieve it. So uh, we are suggesting that further examination of the ways that property tax abatement programs could be adapted to accomplish this goal, to accomplish the purposes of a land value tax, uh, would be justified. And uh, so that's the agenda we're pursuing, is to think a little bit harder about this. Now, we're, we're academics, and so we have the, uh, the luxury of thinking about this uh, in a purely academic way. Uh, but we're quite well aware of uh, the policy uh, difficulties that may be involved as well, and we'll take those into account as we uh, continue to think. But at least for now, we're in thinking mode. Uh, we're, uh, we're trying to think a little bit harder and deeper about uh, whether this is feasible. So if you're interested, if, uh, if this uh, talk has piqued your interest in some way, uh, the paper is available. Uh, Dick and I have a land, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy working paper, uh, WP11JA1. Uh, our property tax abatements for business structures an indirect form of land value taxation. Uh, that should be available on the website, right? And uh, then if you're interested in some of the other resources I've mentioned, uh, the land value taxation book, uh, subtitle Theory, Evidence, and Practice, a good academic title, uh, uh, edited by Dick Dye and uh, Richard England, who are both in the audience here this afternoon, is available. Uh, then, uh, secondly, assessing the, the theory and practice of land value taxation. Uh, this is a policy focus report uh, put out by the Lincoln Institute and is a, a kind of uh, more applied uh, and accessible uh, version. It's the short version of the book, right? Uh, so the policy focus report is a short version of the book with, uh, with a more policy uh, focused emphasis. And then finally, I mentioned uh, my work with Rob Wassmer. Uh, our book is Bidding for Business, the Efficacy of Local Economic Development Incentives in a Metropolitan Area. This is the Detroit research I mentioned, uh, published by the Upjohn Institute in uh, 2000. So, if you're interested in pursuing uh, these topics, then those are the resources that are available that you can uh, go to. Well, with that, let me stop and see what uh, questions or comments you might have, and we can interact over this idea. Is the idea that down the road the uh, land uh, tax will be increased once the businesses are established? Well, I mean, that's certainly possible, but uh, that's not necessarily built into our assumption. Uh, the idea is that you would tax land, and you go, if you go back to Henry George's idea, you would tax land and land only, uh, and you know, you would tax it at a rate that, uh, that, that would uh, generate the revenue necessary to produce the public goods and services. Uh, in fact, in his version, right, that would be the only tax you would need. Uh, so his proposal was the single tax on land. Uh, at the current level of services provided by uh, governments in the United States, that's probably not feasible, uh, the single tax idea. But nonetheless, uh, you would tax land, uh, and uh, there, there's no particular assumption that you would raise the value over time, but you certainly could. Yeah. So, question as a practical matter, in an urban area, the raw land is very rarely sold or bought. So the question I have is, how would you differentiate? How would you determine what the land value is as opposed to the building in the land or yeah. just the building value? Yeah, this is, this is a vexing problem that uh, we're well aware of. And in fact, over the years, a number of us have been involved in various Lincoln projects to try to separate out uh, land value from improvement value. Uh, uh, most assessing agencies will give you property value, which is a combination. And uh, it's difficult to disentangle the two, uh, land value uh, from uh, improvement value. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's something we're well aware of, and there's been a lot of research uh, conducted around uh, by both uh, technically oriented assessors as well as economists. And in fact, Lincoln's got continuing research projects uh, that are looking at how to estimate land value separately from improvement value. Uh, but I will admit, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, situation. Uh, if I could use a baseball metaphor, uh, 
So what is Albert Pujols really worth, right? Is it $254 million over 10 years, uh, which the Angels have just uh, decided to pay him? Uh, it's the same problem here. Uh, uh, the value of Albert Pujols depends crucially on, uh, on the performance of the three batters in the lineup before him. If he's batting number four in the lineup, uh, when he hits a home run, he's far more productive if the, if the bases are loaded uh, than if they're not. Uh, and so it's hard to establish his value independently of the other inputs in this process, the other players. And it's much the same problem here uh, that gives us the difficulty in neatly separating land value from improvement value. Uh, but, but there are ways in which uh, we've worked on doing this over the years, and we can approximate uh, the value of the land independently. Uh, you know, from the parcels that do sell, the vacant land parcels, uh, you know, we have to worry about whether the vacant land parcels are systematically different from the non-vacant land parcels, and, and they may be, but we've got statistical ways to take care of uh, sample selection bias and so on. Dick? To follow that, I'm Dick Dye, the co-author of Everybody Mentioned. Uh, <laughs> if implementation is the issue, uh, abatement is much easier than, than directly assessing the land value. Right. So that's a, that's a particular plus right. for this indirect way of achieving the land value technique. Yeah, good. And yeah, my question is, what is the evidence that the business is indeed responsive yeah. in their location to this abatement? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and and there's, there again, there's, there's a large literature on how responsive firms actually are. And of course, there are varying results. Uh, in some cases, firms are apparently not very responsive. Uh, uh, if you look, if you talk to uh, site, site selection uh, people, of course, they'll, they've got a long list of things that matter. Uh, and taxes are usually not at the top of that list. Uh, as Rob uh, Wasper and I reviewed all of the literature on this issue in our book, Bidding for Business, our conclusion was it's, it's often the case that a firm will make a, a location decision on the basis of the fundamental economics. They either want to be close to the factors of production they need to produce their product, or they want to be close to the markets where they're going to distribute the final product. And they'll, they'll pick a region on the basis of fundamental economics. But then within that region, let's suppose you want to locate in the Great Lakes, then whether you locate in Illinois or across the line in Indiana uh, may depend on local tax incentives. Uh, and so there, there are actually, you know, are, there are studies that, sh that demonstrate that firms can be uh, responsive to some tax incentives. Uh, as, as we found in, in Metro Detroit, uh, where, you, where we had the advantage of having 112 uh, local jurisdictions in the metro area, they would compete against one another for business location and uh, we found some of the incentives actually had an impact on employment. We were, we were looking at whether uh, the incentives actually translated into changes in employment levels, uh, trying to get at the jobs issue, and we found some of the incentives actually had an impact uh, you know, but uh, I'm careful to characterize them as uh, selected incentives and usually over uh, selected periods of time. We did find in some of our research uh, that as more and more of the jurisdictions in a, in a metro area adopted the same type of incentive that the power of the incentive was dissipated and they didn't have much impact later on. Uh, so you know, some incentives seem to matter uh, and uh, the trick uh, from an economic development point of view is figuring out which ones uh, and for whom, right? That's, that's the, the hard part of it. The, the idea of uh, creating this incentive to relocate, capture this new business uh, makes sense. I'm wondering from a policy standpoint, you have many manufacturing firms that are already there. Mm -hmm. So now you've given a, an abatement to a new firm coming in, oftentimes uh, currently it rolls off, uh, yeah. At some point, but are you contemplating that it would be permanent just on the new locators, or would that be across no, the I mean, board? If you're going to you're gonna go all the way to a land value tax, then it would be for anybody, new or old. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, you treat them all identically, and you would tax only the value of the land uh, and none of the improvements. And so, from that point of view, you avoid the political problem of treating the newcomers differently uh, 
than the uh, the existing firms in your in your community. And and by calling it an abatement rather than a shift to a land value tax, does that get around the the the, the legislative kind of? Well, that depends on the particular. Yeah, it yeah, depends it, on your you know the statutes that are relevant in your jurisdiction. It, it also seems to me that underlying all of this discussion is the importance of accurate assessments that accurately value land. I'm a bit familiar right. with Pittsburgh, and my understanding there is that the company who did the reassessment did a very flawed job, and yeah, that's so what I heard. maybe Jane got, could comment. Got angry about that, yeah. and and so it was a flawed assessment. I live in a nearby community where a lot of our commercial land is obviously underutilized. You know, too many parking lots, too many um, auto dealerships, you know, some very prime real estate. It's obviously just uh, speculative land. And if we could just get that land accurately assessed, I think that some development would just happen. Um, and how, you know, are there good guidelines for accurately assessing land? I mean, we want yes. to attract more commercial development in this community. It's Arlington, right up the road. Yeah. And you know, I just feel we need to make sure that our land is properly assessed. There are some large parcels that have recently sold that had existing buildings on them. So my feeling is you take them, whatever the cost of the purchase was, add to that the cost of the teardown, and that gives you a pretty good idea of what the land value is. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and in fact, there's there's some very good uh, research in economics by some colleagues who are also fellows here at the Lincoln Institute that have looked at teardowns as a, as a way to get at uh, land values. Uh, this is in the context of the city of Chicago. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, any, any property tax system uh, that you might want to implement uh, requires at its very heart uh, an accurate as assessment or appraisal uh, system. Without that, uh, it's arbitrary. Is, is that yeah. easier to do than changing legislation that <coughs> for like split rate taxation? I mean, Well, usually if you want to apply split rate, you've got to have uh, the legal framework in order to do that, to tax the different... But, but just an assessment that, that makes sure it actually it accurately yeah. assesses land. That that yeah that usually is constitutional, <laughs> accurate assessment. Okay. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, on the residential side, <clears throat> there's a secondary effect that people haven't been very successful measuring. But that is, if you take the tax off of capital, yeah, you reduce the cost of capital, mm -hmm. and so people will use more of it. So the notion is that a land value tax will encourage higher densities. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, it hadn't occurred to me until now, but sitting here listening to this, what's the evidence when you take an abatement, when you put place an abatement, you reduce the capital cost for an industry, they use more of it and less labor. Is there any evidence that when you put abatements in place, you actually reduce employment as, as opposed to, you know, I, I've never thought about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and the short answer is no. I don't know of any evidence that demonstrates you reduce employment as a result of... Uh, You're changing the relative price of factors. Yes, I mean, right, right, right. You know, in, in pure economic theory, you, you would expect if you make uh, one factor uh, cheaper, the firm will use more of it and less of the other factor if they're, you know, if they're complements uh, or substitutes, excuse me, if they're substitutes in the production process. Now, it could be that uh, land and, and uh, excuse me, uh, capital and, and labor are complementary, in which case you've got, uh, you know, Leontief production and, uh, and you get a different kind of outcome. But, uh, yeah, the short version is I'm not aware of studies that show abatements uh, demonstrate uh, uh, employment losses, uh, at least not systematically, uh, but that's a great question uh, as to why not? Why don't we observe that? The current way most abatement programs are configured uh, provides some uncertainty uh, and that if you went all the way to a land value tax, there ought to be more certainty, right? There's no question about how your improvements will be assessed. Uh, I mean, my, my, my experience is, is colored by uh, manufacturing and the problems of uh, assessment of manufacturing plants uh, where it's very diffi difficult for an assessor to walk into a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility and, uh, and, and get an accurate idea what all this equipment is worth. Uh, and uh, how do you factor in economic obsolescence, which is the hot issue these days? Uh, 
if the market conditions have changed in such a way that that machinery is no longer capable of producing the same kind of uh, profit for the firm that it was just three years ago, uh, it may be economically obsolete. Uh, all of that is swept away in a land value tax where you don't have to assess any of those improvements, any of that machinery or equipment, uh, and you've just got the challenge of figuring out what the land is worth. Uh, so in some sense, uh, moving to a land value tax ought to uh, be more straightforward. Now, you know, I, I can't, I mean, back to the question about w w would, uh, would the local uh, community raise rates over time, I mean, that's a kind of political uncertainty that I can't handicap. Uh, so I don't know about that part of it. Yeah, this is basically a, um, a tax break for business from the strictly inter-jurisdictional inter point of view. So in that sense, um, we, we, um, we had a case in, in Brazil of competition of, among states giving away their tax bases to attract industries. We, yeah. Even in municipalities, this is becoming illegal there because it, it was basically a race to the bottom of that. Yeah. So, um, and we have also some evidence of municipalities that have gone further away on that are the ones that have the biggest social problems, informalities, slums, and things like that, because they yeah. basically, they use their tax for, to attract industry mostly instead of go, going to social overhead capital. <coughs> yeah. so, any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, well, you're quite right. One, I mean, one of the fears is that you do get this kind of race to the bottom. You get uh, jurisdictions competing with one another, and there's no floor under it. Uh, I mean, there are uh, economic models that, that uh, would argue that, that you know, competition is healthy, uh, that you want uh, communities to offer different packages of public services and tax rates, and you'll get a kind of sorting uh, that's uh, efficiency enhancing. Uh, but of course, the worry is uh, if, if, if the context allows them to just debate away everything, uh, you get this race to the bottom. Uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, sure how to uh, respond to that, whether, whether we've actually seen that uh, in the U.S. or not. We've, we've certainly seen competition, but whether it's gotten to the point where uh, we're at the bottom, so to speak, you know, is, not, is not entirely clear. I've, I've seen the content, same kind of issue uh, in some of my recent research relates to uh, Chinese municipalities. Um, I've been working with Joyce Mann and her group at Peking University, and I've got data over a 10-year period of time for all of the prefecture-level cities in China where I'm looking at the rates that they're charging on their land leases. Government retains ownership of the land, and they lease the land. And I'm looking at how the lease prices may uh, implicitly reflect economic development incentives if they're leasing the land at uh, below market rates as their economic development incentive. And uh, it's interesting. I, I find uh, some evidence in earlier years that they were uh, effectively giving away the land uh, at very low rates. Uh, but I'm finding in later years uh, that the rates are rising uh, and they're, uh, they're capturing a good amount of that uh, revenue uh, from the land leases. In fact, these land leases now are one of the biggest sources of revenues they have. In the fastest growing Chinese cities, uh, the land leases are generating anywhere from two to three times the amount of revenue uh, that they're getting in their combined budgets. Uh, so they're very large sources of revenue, which means they're, uh, they're pricing them at, at higher rates than they had been earlier in their experience. And so, so it's this interesting dynamic question of whether uh, they, were they were offering low rates uh, to begin with, uh, and now that the markets are maturing, they're uh, raising their rates o over time. Uh, but yeah, these, these are uh, important issues you raise that, that, that are part of the concern you would have to think about as you, uh, as you contemplate this, this proposal we're suggesting. I brought up some copies of the uh, policy focus report that Dick and Richard did. So if anybody wants to pick one up, I'll leave it in the, the back of the room here. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a nice summary of, uh, of the whole book. Uh, you know, you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to read the whole book. You can read the policy focus report. Yeah. One last question. To me, it, it seems once you go into this abatement just on commercial, yeah. and you're planning on contemplating across the board just commercial, what's happening is you're, you're effectively, every municipality, it's a local tax, you got to collect enough revenue to pay the bills. Right. 
So if you don't do it across the board, you're effectively permanently shifting the burden from away from commercial onto residential and other uses. How do you contemplate dealing with that? Well, that's what, you know, there is a distributional shift involved, and that's part of what we, you know. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a two-handed economist, right? On the one hand, but on the other hand. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it may well be a, a, a distributional shift that's worth taking on, uh, you know, if there are the efficiency enhancements that we expect would come from a land value tax. Can I go back to your baseball player value question? And that is, if you're a municipality that has a local sales tax, then if you can attract commercial activity and you can get sales tax revenue, it, yeah, it, so. it, it could be a, a very important and sensible thing to do. And so, it, you know, it, there's a there more than one moving part of this machine. Yeah. Yeah, that's certainly what I found with the Chinese cities is that, uh, you know, that what comes back to them is uh, in the form of their business tax, which is a local tax, and then they get a portion of the value-added tax that's collected centrally and it comes back as well. And that's part of the reason uh, that they're uh, willing to uh, offer low-rate leases and so, and, uh, because they, they get the additional revenue from these other sources as well. Dick, a final comment? Or if you're concerned with equity across classes, you can take care of that with a separate policy instrument as is done in Massachusetts. And it's probably better to keep the, the things separable. Yeah, what, what policy instrument are you talking about? Uh, classification. Well, through classification. Since Proposition 2 and a half, you've got, you've got classification here. And then states provide property tax relief in various forms. You know, I'm, I'm currently working on a chapter for a forthcoming book as well on circuit breaker mechanisms that provide uh, property tax relief to homeowners. Uh, and so states have got uh, numerous policy tools, including homestead exemptions and uh, credits and deductions and so on, uh, to, that generally apply to homeowners and the residential class. Not to mention, in states like mine, in uh, Nebraska, where we've got uh, a classified system where uh, property taxes applied to agricultural land are 25 percent below those applied to all other classes. Uh, and then if, you're, uh, if you have agricultural land in, in a county that has a uh, green belt law, a uh, zoning law, uh, call it, uh, you can qualify for use value assessment and uh, the land is taxed uh, in its current use uh, growing corn, what else? Uh, rather than uh, looking at its highest and best use, which might be uh, subject to development pressure on the fringe of a major city like Omaha. So yeah, there, there's, there are many other ways in which uh, uh, property tax burdens are uh, uh, relieved and redistributed in, in the system that would have to be uh, part of a bigger picture as well. Well, let me thank you for your attentiveness and uh, say it's been a real pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.